President Daniels, thank you so much for joining us. It's your first time on the This Is Purdue podcast, and we appreciate your time. Um, it's been a crazy year. <laughs> so let's start with commencement, though. That was held outside at Ross Aid Stadium for the first time ever, and it went very well, beautiful weather. Um, you rode in on the infamous couch cart. So tell me about that experience. Well, you know, the, the, the uh, couch that Ethan and Nathan put together was such a, such a boilermaker thing to do, first of all. We, you know, uh, inventive, in, uh, innovative, a little fun. Uh, and uh, as long as this school's been here, we've, we've had great uh, tinkerers and, and inventors. And so, as, as I think you know, it's a go-kart engine with a, with a uh, garden cart they bought at the Menards or somewhere. And a, and, a, and a couch that was exactly what a, I'll say, male student's college couch probably <laughs> should look like. I remember those kind, holes in them and springs almost coming out of them. Actually, quite a comfortable ride. You know, um, uh, I, I told people that it doesn't, it doesn't corner very well, but it has a good straight line acceleration. Yeah, it was quite the entrance. What was it like writing your commencement speech this year? I always do it. Uh, or try to have a first draft done over Christmas vacation. It's my big homework assignment of the year. You know, I, I personally, although it is always a worry item for me, I, I think it's a good tradition at Purdue that whoever has this job give that speech. For one thing, it, it simplifies the problem of uh, who you invite, uh, will, everybody, will somebody not like the choice? Uh, it, um, probably ensures that we keep this the at least while i'm doing it that the keep the ceremony uh, a little bit concise and tight but um, i worry over it because uh, every every student sitting there has um, uh, worked awfully hard and i feel like i should also try to say something that is meaningful yeah, i mean Unfortunately, we've all heard commencement speeches where somebody pulled out of Bartlett's quotations and strung together a bunch of cliches. And uh, I try to do something that fits the times and the moment. Now, this year, um, as I wrote it, uh, and it really didn't change much after New Year's, um, I was very conscious that this whole thing could be rendered obsolete because COVID is it's still evolving, and it certainly was back then. Uh, and uh, so I thought, you know, th this might be uh, something I have to start over on, but I didn't. And um, it seemed to be very well received. I've gotten lots and lots of, of uh, nice comments and um, people elsewhere. Um, I was interviewed on national television yesterday by somebody who saw it and thought it had some value to it. So, um, as I say, it's it's always my number one assignment of the year, and uh, uh, I, I think it came off reasonably well. I agree. Did you feel differently writing it this year versus past years, though, because of you know all of the different challenges and adversity that Purdue as a whole faced this year? I think I think so because uh, while I always try to think about those messages from a Purdue standpoint and, the, and a student standpoint, this year was um, to me the you, you couldn't give a talk at the end of this year and not center it somehow on the experience that we just went through. Uh, but I just thought that especially what our students did, the way they conducted themselves, the character that they showed which, as I've said over and over, was the indispensable element. Yes, we did a hundred other things so that everyone's education could keep moving unimpeded, but um, uh, would have all gone for naught had we not had the student kind of students that we did. And so um, to that extent, I thought it wrote itself, and then I tried to put it in the larger context that, in my opinion, too many other places, too many other uh, people and institutions um, did not live up to their responsibilities, and we expect our graduates, wherever they go, to do so. Sure, and you talked a lot about taking risks and the importance of these, making these big decisions. And looking back, do you ever second guess your decision to fully open Purdue? 
Well, it ended well, so you don't have to now. I wouldn't use the word second guess, but I would, I would say, I mean, on a daily basis, we questioned what we were doing. First thing every morning of last semester, in the second semester, we were able to feather it back to three and then two times a week, because I don't believe in meetings for, the, for meeting's sake. But last semester, every morning, first thing, we were looking at the data, looking at where the cases were, were, they, were any of them severe? And um, so, of course, we were, um, we were fretting about that on a constant basis, knowing that uh, however under control things seem to be today, we could get up tomorrow and have a different situation. Sure. And, and, and we learned a lot. I mean, you say second guess. I mean, now we can look back, and I've, I've pointed out, we did a number of things that we thought might help. Now we know much more. and and probably didn't need two miles of plexiglass, didn't need uh, uh, to uh, uh, spend all the time we did rearranging dorm rooms uh, and the beds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we probably uh, cleaned and sanitized surfaces more obsessively than uh, made any real difference, but we weren't going to leave anything to chance. And so to that extent, I'm glad we did what we did, even though some of it was probably uh, not too important. Sure. And what was it? What was it like? And how did you feel telling the world last April, Purdue is going to be fully opened and have you know in-person classes and activities? Apprehensive. Um, it looked like I felt very much it was the right thing to do if we could bring it off. That it would. I'll say it the other way around. I thought it would be a default of responsibility to just throw up our hands and say. This might not work, so all 35,000 of you, you know, figure it out. Take a year off or something. And, um, but of course, uh, but that's the essence of difficult decisions. You don't know, and you can't know. And if you try to wait till you think you know everything, it's usually way too late for uh, whatever call that was to, to uh, succeed. What do you think you were most worried about leading up to the 2020-2021 school year? The uh, factors that would have um, uh, caused us to uh, call a halt or make a U-turn, um, there, were, there were three um, indicia that I think I worried about or thought about the, the most. First and foremost was severity. I don't know why others didn't do this, but early on I asked our medical advisors, construct for us a simple measure of how ill people are. Because if any significant number of either students or staff were getting really dangerously ill, that would have been a trigger. And so there was a one to six um, uh, a little simple system they, they created, one asymptomatic all the way up to six, you better go to the hospital. Uh, uh, only 2% of all the cases we had all year ever got past level three or something like that. So that was one thing that we watched very carefully and happily. We had just a tiny number even of hospitalizations and, uh, and, and uh, those resolved. So then um, a, a second thing would have been um, if we'd run out of quarantine space, because we knew it was essential when someone had it, so transmissible, to move them to a place till they weren't going to infect someone else. We never got close to that either. We, um, uh, again, we turned out we had many more uh, beds for that than we thought we might. The third thing would have, uh, might need, um, and the third thing would have been if the local hospitals, emergency rooms, or I'm sorry, intensive care units, were overwhelmed and, and, and we had anything to do with it. It was our staff or our students. Happily, that didn't happen either. Those were the three, maybe not the only three, but those were the three um, indicators that I probably watched the most closely. Sure. And um, the Boilermakers Keep Going video featuring you, that's, I remember watching that during the IU Purdue game. As it, it came out as a commercial, I turned to my husband, who's an IU graduate, and I was like, did you just see that? Mm -hmm. He was like, that was good. I'll admit it. 
Um, I just remember feeling so proud to be a Boilermaker. Was there a certain moment that you can look back on and think of that you were the most proud of this Purdue community? Oh, I was proud throughout. That I, I was, I was, I was proud of our folks for the, making that video. I, um, you know, I had said to them uh, before, and not real unrelated really to the pandemic. We get these slots on the Big Ten network, and occasionally somewhere else, where you're able to uh, put your institution on display for 60 seconds. I said, every, ours look just like everybody else's. St people standing around with beakers, you know, and you know, huddled over a, a, a computer screen or something. And I said, now there's some things that are unique about Purdue, and w we should emphasize those. Well, came this last year, and, I, and we really did have something that was different. So many of our peers didn't go to school at all, or uh, everybody was stuck in their room all the time, or that, you know, no in-person classes and so forth. And so I was, uh, I, I thought they did a really great job of, um, of uh, showing others what, if you were here, you saw our students, our faculty, this institution, you know, coming together to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a single biggest lesson that you think you've learned throughout the past 15 months or maybe several? Well, we've all learned so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we could fill another podcast with what we've learned about uh, how to mix online instruction with in-person, uh, about work that does pretty darn well on a remote basis or partially remote. There's all sorts of lessons like that that I hope we learn and, and, and adapt. It'll make people's uh, uh, work family lives uh, better. It would be environmentally better if fewer people are driving and parking and so forth. Um, it, to me, it was not a surprise that this university, and I'm going to go back to the students first and foremost, um, did come together and, and uh, achieve what it did. Not a, not a big surprise, but uh, certainly gratifying to see one's impressions or positive suspicions uh, borne out. Yeah, and I talked to Dr. Ramirez, mm -hmm. um, and he just had so much praise for the students, and I know I've heard, I've heard you speak as well on that. Is there anything that, looking back, maybe you would have done differently? Oh, sure. I mean, I've already mentioned several things we did that um, maybe the dollars we spent, the effort we spent could have been directed at, at something else. Um, uh, I hope we won't have to you know, go through it again, but there's quite a playbook, and, and we've tried to be very honest with ourselves and others about things that were valuable, others that weren't. But, um, uh, yeah, I, I, th I think the one thing I would emphasize is we probably should have been more attentive, maybe aggressive than we were. Uh, too many courses were started on in-person or were listed as in-person, and then somehow changed to uh, online and too many students uh, were disappointed uh, that that happened and I heard from some students to whom it happened you know maybe three or four courses and that was uh, that wasn't a good thing if we ever had to go through it again I think we'd be much more alert to that try to prevent that happening uh, wherever possible. Sure and what did you miss the most about you know the school year last year was it oh contact with the students uh, you know we all have our own way of doing things but mine for all these years been be out a lot and uh, uh, funning around going to events the gym mm -hmm. a huge change for me I, I used to go three and four times a week and uh, uh, to the co-rec and that uh, couldn't do that had to swap for something much uh, more limited and did you get a peloton <laughs> no I've I've, uh, I've I borrowed a couple of uh, you know uh, uh, aerobic m machines not a peloton okay. and uh, you know uh, uh, some some weights but the the uh, I'll say that the, the range and variety of the workout has shrunk some right <laughs> but I'm still uh, sort of in routine maintenance at this point <laughs> so you know, you recently released a video encouraging students to get their vaccines. 
What do you think needs to change in order for things to open up even more in the fall? It'll depend more than anything else on, on the uh, uh, rate of vaccination of uh, particularly our students, but also our staff. And as you know, uh, we've opted for a, I'll call it a free choice approach. Um, and uh, people have the, the option to just stay with testing, regular testing, which we all went through this last year. But we are strongly encouraging. We think all the evidence supports, um, hopefully, as close to universal vaccination as we can get to on this campus. And the higher that rate is, the more, um, uh, clo the, the closer to uh, the world we knew we can approach and still know that we're not endangering anybody. Yeah, and now we kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, how do you think higher education emerges, you know, after this, this huge pandemic? First of all, we hope we see the light. Yes, true. Um, one of the imponderables is you know, viruses uh, are the ultimate survival uh, machine, and they adapt and they, mute, and they mutate, as we know, and so we're watching all that. But I agree that from uh, everything we can see, including we've now seen some of these variants here, and they're not worse so far. So uh, let's hope that this this path of improvement that we've been on continues. Everybody wants that. Higher ed will be different whenever we're past this. Uh, uh, first of all, because uh, first of all, it uh, has caused even more people to question its value. Now we've talked here at Purdue now for about a decade about higher education at the highest proven value. Such an obvious um, thing to emphasize, I think, because we search for value everywhere else. Buy a house, buy a car, buy your groceries, but, you know, pick choice of restaurants. And uh, now people were already asking, I think, the right questions. How, how much education will I, or my child, uh, uh, garner at institution A versus B per dollar spent. And now that I think that's all become much more um, important. Clearly we will uh, be asked to and need to respond to um, the, the uh, interest of, of students in a more flexible um, uh, education. And so we're already headed this direction, but we better head there fast if we want to um, succeed in the new environment. So that means um, uh, even more opportunities for work experience, internships, and uh, study abroad, and, and um, uh, uh, we're already offering a lot of three-year degrees, which I think may become more uh, popular with students who want to get on with it more affordably and get out and start earning their way in the world. So um, we're going to have to be uh, open to these kind of ideas, and I hope um, a step ahead of other schools in, in, in uh, providing them. Right. And um, you've already touched on this a little bit about how you enjoy you know, being out on the campus, interacting with students. What else are you looking forward to you know, come fall 2021? How about a national basketball championship? <laughs> I'd love be, to hear that. We're going to be good. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, seeing, and I hope discovering, that Purdue at record size is still maintaining its quality, its rigor, uh, a good personal individual experience for students, even though we're going to have more than by far than we've ever had. I've, um, most of your viewers, I hope, will, will know that for the fourth year out of the last five, uh, it's record attendance, first 10,000 person class, it appears, in Purdue history, and that's probably, if anything I've seen, the biggest in the Big Ten. Now that's wonderful that this university is attracting students from e everywhere, great students, but it, it imposes a great responsibility on us to maintain and keep enhancing it. Uh, the quality of each person's experience gets harder as the scale gets bigger. But um, a lot of our faculty and others here talk about excellence at scale. We've got the biggest engineering school in the world's top five or ten. Uh, 
And um, I don't want to say it's easy. It's a lot easier to have excellence at a, in a very small, if you're dealing with small numbers. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, see, seeing us meet that very positive challenge as a, as a community. And you mentioned, obviously, the planning for next year is in full swing. Um, and you recently relaunched your presidential lecture series. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone that you'd love to see, you know, come to Purdue and, and speak in that? I don't think we're quite ready to announce the series yet, but I've already recruited uh, um, two or three, and that's probably what we'll have in a given uh, semester. Um, I'll just say that uh, I, I, in any job, a, a person uh, ask, should ask herself, himself, where can I add some values or something I can do that is in any way uh, different or additive to what's already going on? Well, one of those things seemed to me was that uh, because of past lives I had led, I, I might be able to, I sometimes say, increase the intellectual traffic flow through campus and, and recruit people to come here who might not otherwise. And uh, so I hope we can do that again. I think it could be a, a, a real a part of of uh, our students and faculty and our neighboring community, um, uh, positive experience. And so, uh, yeah, we're gonna, I look forward to getting that rolling again, and I hope in person uh, as we were accustomed to before. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. And you mentioned your past life. You've said your time at Eli Lilly was some of, you know, the best experience ahead of becoming the governor of Indiana. And I've had the pleasure of speaking with people from Purdue Polytechnic High School, um, the data mine here at Purdue, and they've just been raving about the partnerships with Eli Lilly. What does that mean to you to see, you know, your past life and your current life yeah. kind of combine? Well, obviously, anything involving Lilly has special, I have special affection for, uh, I, I frankly, I've told a lot of students here that, uh, 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 who ask about career planning, I laugh and talk about what a lousy career planner I was and just life planned me. I, I thought I would finish my working days at Eli Lilly and Company. I, I believed in our mission was saving lives, improving lives, advancing science. The people there were in, invariably of, of great character and, and uh, mutually supportive of each other. It was just a wonderful uh, uh, pl uh, place to work. Uh, and, um, uh, and that corporation was a great community. Um, so of course uh, I'm I'm very uh, interested in um, that the, anytime we interact with them, they they uh, year in year out. Let's face it, we're good for Lily because for decades now, and it's still the case, they're one of our top. They they hire more graduates here than almost any company, and uh, but no, they uh, it, it's no surprise they've been great as we say corporate citizens for as long as that company's been there. And so uh, the only surprise would be if they weren't directly involved in helping us with our high schools or uh, the uh, programs here on campus. And, and meanwhile, uh, now the whole world has learned uh, how fortunate we are to have great pharmaceutical companies, great science that goes on there. Uh, they've just saved who, who knows how many lives. Yeah, absolutely. And you said on the Business and Beyond podcast recently that you're very, you know, there's a piece of you that's glad that you didn't run for president because you would have never ended up here at Purdue. What is, what have the past eight years meant to you? <laughs> well, not a piece of me, all of me. True, you know, you're all here. You know, my, some, I've, I've told some of our folks, with people, when they bring that up, I say uh, things like, uh, you know, at this point in life, I'm not taking the demotion, <laughs> right? Uh, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. I didn't see it coming. As I said, I... And as I, I, I thought I'd uh, uh, finish my working days at that great company we just discussed. Uh, life changed not once, but three times since. And uh, this change was, uh, was uh, uh, my favorite in many respects. Um, no, I mean, it's been uh, a huge learning experience for me and hope we've contributed some things to um, ad advancing the university's interest. But uh, I... Uh, I, I can't imagine anything else I might have done being more, more fulfilling than uh, the, the time we've been able to spend at Purdue. I graduated in 2012, so I just missed you. But um, I remember hearing that and just thinking that was amazing. 
So let's get into some fun things. <laughs> well, this has been fun. <laughs> you mean we would have more fun than that? So it wouldn't be Indiana if we didn't talk about the Indianapolis 500. Yeah. Do you plan on going to the race? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have seats? or? Well, I've been to a lot of, well, full, full disclosure, I have been involved with uh, um, previously the Holman Corporation and now the Penske Entertainment, which is this marvelous development of this great, great person, Roger Penske. Uh, uh, now I've gotten to know a little bit. He's everything that uh, he was reported to be dynamo in his in his 80s on and just uh, done great things there and everywhere else he's been in business uh, so yes I'll, I'll be there as I have been over and over I've uh, 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 on that shelf over there you, you can see a picture of me I've been a I was a big booster of of auto racing especially in my last job in particular and even before that and uh, as far as I know I'm the only person from um, elected office who's ever been the uh, official starter of the race. It was 2012. Nice. Your graduation year. Scary, by the way. You were in the car. Well, I, I've done that. No, okay. I mean, I was, I waved the green you, flag. Oh, and those cars are roaring past you. And a lot of wind up there. <laughs> and uh, when I say scary, I say, you know, I don't know if anybody's going to see this flag, but I'll tell you what's not going to happen. It's, I, it's not going to wind up in the first turn. <laughs> Because I'd yeah. never live it down. <laughs> that was a fabulous uh, uh, opportunity. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know when uh, anyone will see this uh, conversation we're having, but the uh, this year's race, it's always one of the biggest sporting events in the year. It's always the biggest spectator event of any kind in the world. But this year, it's not just a sporting event. If it goes off well, let's hope and pray it does. I mean, it, it is a big, it's a, it's a worldwide event on the way back to normalcy. This will be the most people in one place for any reason, I think, uh, since the pandemic started. And um, so it's, in a way, it's a, it's a medical event uh, as well as a, uh, the greatest spectacle in racing. Right. Do you have any uh, favorites for drivers? Are you betting on anyone? Well, those are two different questions. <laughs> I won't have any bets then, okay. no. Ed Carpenter, if, if you just make me pick somebody, he's a, he's a great person and he's homegrown, got to root for the home team. We've got a number of teams and drivers from, from Indiana, but uh, Ed is one. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll be watching the 20 car with, with special interest. Awesome. And are you going to slow down at all this summer, or does your pace keep going? <laughs> Uh, there's some natural. I, I, I've, I've told friends from other times, you know, I'd never had a seasonal job before. This isn't quite that. It's not, uh, but uh, you no, know, clearly when, when the campus population drops from 40 some thousand students to several thousand, um, it's, it's different. And, um, but, uh, you know, there's plenty to keep us busy. And, and planning for this fall uh, will, uh, uh, just as it was last summer, there are some additional features that that uh, my predecessors and I in earlier years didn't have to think about uh, uh, as as you saw August coming. Sure, absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? I just hope that uh, I, I think Boilermakers have always had a special affinity and pride for this place. And that's not, that would be a natural thing. I'm sure people at every school feel that way, but this has been measured. And there is a, a statistically significant difference, has been, uh, a people's sense of, uh, of loyalty and so forth. I've always assigned a lot of that to the fact that, that this, has, this is a place of upward mobility. That's why land grant schools were created, but I think in Purdue's case, it's especially pronounced. I, 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 I say all the time, I've now had a chance for a decade to meet so many tremendous Purdue alums. Almost none of them came from privilege. This is the place where um, the young woman or man from the farm or the small town or the inner city came from. 
And then over and over, by the now hundreds of thousands, were launched on great lives. And so we've always been proud, and I think that's part of it. I've, I've talked to so many people, and, and, it, all, and it starts the same. It, it, for, it, for me, it started at Purdue. I owe it to Purdue, if not for Purdue. It's the thing I love the very most about this place, as you can see from my, my sniffles. And uh, I hope the last year added a layer on top of that for all the reasons we just discussed. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think anyone, like we talked about with that Boilermakers Keep Going, it's, it's emotional, it'll, it'll get you every time. Well, it, I do think it, it reflects, it's like the couch. Somebody said, well, that's a Purdue thing. Yes. You know, <laughs> tinkering around and inventing something and, uh, that works. <laughs> and uh, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to think that uh, our navigating through this difficult circumstance expressed a uh, something that's always been there about this place absolutely well we so appreciate your time thank you and your energy and we love talking to you and it, it was all fun all, <laughs> all of it i agree <laughs>